Hi, I'm Patrick, and welcome back to ICIP, also known as Edinburgh's answer to Khan Academy. Hey, welcome to History Part 2. Last time we tackled the first part of our little gallop through the history of the international system, and that was the long 19th century. And we ended with the First World War, which we found out was this cataclysmic collapse of a relatively stable order in Europe that had come out of the Congress of Vienna. The Congress of Vienna really as the expression of Europe searching for a stable order. And we had heard that that had gone well almost a hundred years until it catastrophically broke down with the outbreak of the First World War. So what we'll do today is we'll pick up at the First World War and we'll spin this tale all the way until today. And because I went a little overlong with the last one, I'll keep this one uh, a little bit shorter. So um, what we will do today is uh, we will start right as the First World War ended. Um, remember that we said, of course, that this is a war. This was a war of many firsts. There was the first uh, trench warfare, the first kind of industrialized uh, type of warfare, the first time you had um, such a multitude of countries involved in a war. Uh, there's a reason why it, it, uh, later we call it a world war, obviously. And it ended eventually with um, Germany uh, having to capitulate um, or the uh, Germany and Austro-Hungary having to capitulate and the Allies winning the war. The aftermath required quite a bit of adjustment and did require quite a bit of input because much like 100 years before at the Congress of Vienna, there was a lot to do. There, a lot had happened, obviously, in the meantime. Um, I love this picture because what you see there is in Philadelphia in 1919, uh, people are looking at a new map of Europe. So, for example, a lot of the territories of Europe had to be redistributed and of course Europe had to find some way to deal with the massive human casualties uh, on a scale absolutely unimaginable until the first world war or the great war as it was called at the time had come around um, one little very local illustration is you see here this is kind of an early version of photoshop you see at the top is a real photo that was the cameron highlanders um, the regiment as it had gone into battle in 1914 and at the bottom you see all that remained of the cameron highlanders at the end of the first world war four years later so that might give you at least a tiny bit of an impression of the human toll that this took and then of course because we're currently in a pandemic, let's not forget that just as they had ended the First World War, the Spanish flu came through, and the Spanish flu killed 50 million people in one year, which was more than the plague had killed in a century. So a series of really almost apocalyptic events, obviously, that Europe had to deal with somehow. So um, what they did is very much like at the Congress of Vienna, where the idea was to talk and negotiate about the post-Napoleonic order. We now had to deal with a post-World War I order. And this happened at the so-called Paris Peace Conference. It's not surprising that it happened in Paris, obviously. And the two big things that came out of the Paris Peace Conference was one, the Treaty of Versailles, which you will undoubtedly have heard about. And B, it also gave the impetus for the League of Nations. Now, I will not talk about the League of Nations almost at all today because we will have a whole lecture on it um, when we come the, uh, to the United Nations because it was, of course, the predecessor organization of the UN. The idea behind both the treaty and the League of Nations was that there had to be a new structure in place to help stabilize this post-war world. The first job of this new order was to restructure the territories, much like it had been 100 years before after Napoleon. Someone had to carve up Europe in a new way because no fewer than four major empires had ended in the First World War. Austria-Hungary, Germany, the Ottoman Empire, and Tsarist Russia, uh, which had uh, gone through the Russian Revolution. Its second job of the Paris Peace Conference was to supervise and constrain Germany as the aggressor state, much like 100 years earlier, we were trying to constrain France. And then the third part was to safeguard peace, so to find some structure, some institution that could help Europe 
um, find a lasting peace. Um, now remember at the Congress of Vienna they had hit on the idea of conference diplomacy and negotiation. Here the idea was maybe if we created a global institution that could canalize these types of um, conflicts. So you see here even though almost a hundred years had passed you have very strong parallels between what the allied what the victorious forces tried to do at the end of the paris peace conference compared to what the victorious powers tried to do at the end of the congress of vienna so you see the first kind of historic large historic pattern emerge here this seems to be something that we tend to do after major cataclysmic wars just to give you a little bit of a taste of how much the paris peace conference really had to do well and that was my cat hitting the buttons here you really shouldn't do that, little bud. Um, just to give you a taster of how much they ha really had to do, all the things in red here were things that were created basically um, wholly new uh, after the Paris Peace Conference. So there was a couple of countries that had not existed during the war or even before the war that were carved out by this Paris Peace Conference. Obviously, there was, for example, the Austro-Hungarian Empire that now suddenly became... Uh, Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia, and Romania, all as independent countries that had not been around, uh, not been around for a good while before that. Um, and the same went, of course, not just for Europe, um, but it also went for uh, the Middle East, where. I mean, fatefully so, there was a few lines drawn in the sand, essentially. You can see the Ottoman Empire and the, on the left here in 1914 was still controlling more or less all of the Middle East. It was already at the outbreak of the war, had been very much an empire in decline. And this was now formalized in that it was carved up, new states were created, and the borders of these new states were very much artificial. Um, if you want to go on a little Wikipedia tangent about the Sykes-Picot line, um, that is still a problem today, even though it's now a hundred years old, basically, um, and is one of the main uh, contributing factors to the conflict in the Middle East, that would be a worthwhile tangent. So this redistribution of territories was one of the main things that the Paris Peace Conference tried to do. After the Paris Peace Conference, we entered this kind of slightly weird period of history that's actually really really interesting where it felt very much like everyone had to make up for lost life basically during the first world war and we entered what was uh, later affectionately called the roaring 20s so we were all you know dancing around and there was you know a little bit too much alcohol being drunk and a little bit too uh, too avant-garde art was being produced but unfortunately the roaring 20s didn't last all that long we had a uh, wave of revolutions, mostly anti-democratic revolutions and regime change all around the world. We of course had the uh, Great Depression and the stock market crash in 1929 when everything, when the, then the, the, the economic world basically just seemed to fall apart. And we had a rise of new um, authoritarian anti-democratic fascist regimes, chief among them of course uh, Germany under Hitler. What is important to remember though is that this was none of these things came particularly as a surprise. Lots of the things that happened after the First World War leading up to the Second World War were kind of a slow burn in the sense that um, there is for example a phenomenon that has been called the authoritarian wave where for almost 20 years you saw state after state in a domino-like way fall um, and revert their earlier democratic attempts and um, turn to authoritarian um, state constitutions. And you see this went all the way from Europe all the way to uh, Latin America. The Versailles system, and by that, what I mean is, uh, and what I mean by that is both the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, they did manage to solve some problems. So we shouldn't discredit it entirely. Um, it did a decent job in supervising Germany, at least for a while. It did a decent job setting new borders, at least those borders were accepted by most participants. And it did eventually find a sustainable way for the um, losers in the war to pay their reparations. One of the big bones of contention was that um, the 
uh, uh, powers that had lost the war were being made to pay exorbitant reparations, uh, with even some victorious powers saying that that would be counterproductive. But in the end, the system could not solve other really major, really fundamental problems. It wasn't set up to deal with those well. It had very little in store f uh, in terms of counteracting those revolutions, um, the, especially the anti-democratic ones, uh, and then later on the, the communist uh, revolution, starting with Soviet Russia. It did very little in dealing with colonialism and the problems that, that came from it. It could not really generate a lasting acceptance of this treaty in Germany, partially because in the treaty, in the Versailles Treaty itself, it was written in there and Germany had signed it that it alone was responsible for all damages and the war itself, which um, didn't endear the German public to the system. It also did a poor job encouraging disarmament among all forces and it really had no tools at its disposal to address the economic downturn. So eventually, we more or less inevitably slid into World War II. And the way that we can think about World War II is, in many ways, World War II was a rerun of World War I. We had similar powers on both sides, and the, um, especially Germany under Hitler was trying to very much finish the job that Germany had earlier not managed to uh, during the First World War. So some historians have even said that it might be a better way to think about this whole time span between 1914 and 1945, these 30 years or so, as a state of the world at war. No, so not two world wars, really just one giant war with maybe a 20-year armistice um, in the middle. Because we all learned so much about World War II, I'm going to say almost nothing about the war. That's not to say, of course, that it wasn't absolutely devastating. We had crazy amounts of uh, people that died either directly in the war or as a result of the war. And remember, this was all in such a short time span. I mean, if you were if you were born in the year 1900, you would be probably by the end of World War II, you would be around the age that your parents would be now. And at that age, you would have gone through two world wars that would have seen something like 70 million people die, plus another 50 million from um, the Spanish flu. You would have seen cities bombed to cinders. You would have seen the Holocaust uh, being un uh, uncovered at the end of it. You would have seen the first atomic bombs being thrown. And it would have just been... Um, an absolutely apocalyptic world that you would have been a part of. 3% of the entire global population, it is estimated, perished in the Second World War. So remember how in the previous lecture we did a little time jump, and the time jump was from a system that seemed relatively stable, the system set up in the Congress of Vienna, to the First World War where the system had collapsed. So we'll do a little time jump here, but we'll do it in the reverse order. And because if we time jump only 45 years ahead, we suddenly see that out of a world that seemed to be so destroyed and so at its lowest point, really, maybe in human history, 45 years later, suddenly we see the hope very much restored and divisions in the world seemingly being healed with the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall here, and the Russian Revolution um, that uh, ended the Soviet Union. I'm old enough that I very much remember when the Berlin Wall fell. I was 11 years old. And the thing I really, really distinctly remember is that my parents, my dad was from Eastern Germany and his, parent, uh, his parents had fled with him as a small child. And I just remember that I sat in the living room and my parents were going completely nuts, jumping around, hugging themselves and falling over couches. And I was just kind of thinking like, hmm, this seems important. I better watch the television really, really closely. I'm sure you might have had one or two of those moments in your own life. So how did we then go from a world that was so, um, so much, uh, so destroyed to a world that seems to have gone back to the path of, of healing at least a little bit? I would point out three major things that we really should remember about that kind of uh, period between 1945 and 1990 about the second, um, about the 20th century. The first major development was that we had the United Nations being founded. So this was very much a League of Nations 2.0. The League of Nations hadn't done its job in preventing World War II. So after the Second World War, they essentially tried again. You know, if at first you don't succeed, 
um, try again. It was a similar setup, um, but this time it uh, was granted uh, greater powers than the League of Nations had, and it had greater buy-in from states because uh, now everyone had not only had the shock of one world war, but two world wars. And if there's anything that focuses your mind, it's two world wars. So we had an institution that had very broad participation. That had been one of the problems with the League of Nations. But of course, something that continues on to this day is that you still have very unequally distributed power. You will be aware that there's a thing called a veto in the UN Security Council. And while the UN Security Council, I would argue, is a very useful institution, it is also a deeply unequal one because you still have today, 2020, it's more than 70 years after the end of the Second World War, you still have the victorious powers of that war having the most power in that particular institution. The second thing, and that was really the dominating thing, if you talk to maybe your grandparents, that will be basically the main thing that they will remember from that whole period, is that the Cold War really organized almost the entire world. It was, of course, tensions between the UK and the US on the one side and the, and the Soviet Union on the other, with the capitalist West on one side and the communist East on the other. And it's always important to remember that to these people that were involved in this, this wasn't just an economic competition. This was a truly deeply fundamentally philosophical, ideological competition. It was seeing which way to see the world was the correct one and which one would win out. Each of the superpowers, um, they didn't go to war with each other. So let's remember that this is a really important fact about the Cold War. That's why it's called the Cold War. It's because we never had a hot war between any of the major powers break out. But it wasn't necessarily a particularly peaceful time because there was lots of wars at the margins. So this was a tense time, but relatively stable. In a slide, I will show you um, how tense this got, though. And then we had, uh, of course, a, a highly important trend for, for a large number of countries today, which is that uh, decolonization really hit its stride um, after the Second World War. So colonialism had been entirely discredited after the Second World War, but decolonization had been poorly managed up until then. And there was a, a, a rising uh, understanding among both the colonized states and the colonizers that this wasn't a situation that could endure. And while this process was fairly slow at the beginning, there was a rapid acceleration, especially in the 50s and 60s, when, for example, in a, in a few short years, almost all of Africa um, gained its independence. Uh, you see, for example, in the picture up here, um, uh, the uh, celebration of Kenya becoming independent. And that's, by the way, Prince Philip on the left there. Um, so uh, decolonization as a big trend that kind of swept through the system and that also really very much changed the power balance on the international level because you suddenly had lots of you know maybe less developed but also um but nonetheless sovereign and equal states appear on the world stage that were all demanding their um, place on the uh, at the table so um, this East versus West is really the, the dominating thing, how we should think about this uh, span of almost 50 years after the Second World War, where you had the, the West pitted against the East. And you see here that, of course, there were things that were in the middle. There were states that declared themselves non-aligned to either system. Um, but you also see, uh, if you look at the number of the crosses, how often it was the case that one side was trying to um, foster and finance uh, guerrillas from the other side in um, a countries at the margins of this uh, east-west conflict. I want to take a second to talk about one particular point in time which I find utterly in, uh, uh, fascinating and super interesting and that is the Cuban Missile Crisis and we're going to not only see how tense the world was and how close the world was to maybe World War III at that point but also maybe that we can um, gather some bigger insights kind of for our understanding about international relations. So the Cuban Missile Crisis very much started uh, with the 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion. Now I know this sounds way long ago uh, but believe me it's going to be an interesting 
um, little case study. The Bay of Pigs invasion really just meant that Cuba was run by communists under Fidel Castro, and the United States didn't like that one bit. So they tried to topple that regime in a variety of ways, including sending Castro explosive cigars, which didn't kill him, obviously, um, and they failed with this particular invasion attempt too. Now, what was different about this invasion attempt here was that as a reaction to the U.S. trying to meddle in Cuban affairs, the USSR agreed to send nuclear missiles to Cuba uh, to protect Cuba from uh, aggression by the United States. Now, that was a bit of a game changer because at that point, the U.S. had nuclear missiles in place that were uh, that had a range far enough to hit Russia, or the USSR, I should say, but not the other way around. But with the missiles being stationed in Cuba, the USSR, uh, with its nuclear missiles, could have basically hit any target in the continental United States at any point. So that was a hugely threatening scenario. The uh, Americans caught wind of this fairly early on, though. They found, for example, that their spy planes that they sent over Cuba saw that there were things being prepared, there was forests being cleared, there was um, munitions being assembled, there were uh, rocket launch sites being built. And uh, this all worried the, the Americans greatly. You see at the bottom here um, a uh, an illustration of all the targets that um, the USSR could have hit from nuclear missiles stationed on Cuba. So on October 14th, 1962, a US spy plane that flies over Cuba collects clear evidence that that is what the USSR is doing there, that they are building uh, bases from which to launch rockets. On October 16th, and by the way, whenever you see a timeline of international relations that is, you know, day by day and everything happens in one month, you know that shit's about to go down. On October 16th then, the U.S. starts drafting possible replies. They weren't expecting the USSR to station missiles there, so they suddenly had to rethink their entire approach to this whole situation. Uh, were they going to choose a diplomatic uh, way of dealing with this? Were they going to launch an invasion before the uh, rockets could be stationed? Um, would they have to call an airstrike? Would they blockade it? And so on. The military high command, uh, John F. Kennedy's generals, very much recommended a full-scale invasion. They wanted to send everything that the U.S. Army, Navy, and Air Force had to Cuba and do away with Castro once and for all and therefore prevent the USSR from stationing its rockets. But Kennedy hesitated because that seemed to be um, kind of the absolute nuclear option, no pun intended in this case. On October 22nd, the U.S. Uh, instead decides that it would uh, uh, conduct a military embargo. They call it a quarantine, which today sounds a bit ironic, um, which meant that they stationed a number of ships and submarines all around Cuba, and their job was to intercept any ships that looked like they could be carrying weapons, especially nuclear weapons, into Cuba. Russia was very unhappy with this because very soon after this embargo, this quarantine had started, the U.S. already had started to uh, stop and frisk uh, Russian ships. So on October 24th, the USSR in the um, uh, publicly called the U.S. Act, uh, the U.S. actions piracy and an act of aggression. And in response to these um, kind of uh, mutual threats, the Security Council, the UN Security Council, meets on October 25th, in which the USSR is a little taken aback because they hadn't really anticipated the US reacting this strongly to the rockets um, being stationed there. Now, whether or not that is that wasn't so smart to not expect that reaction, I'll leave that up to you. But they did not expect this vehemence of uh, the American reaction to their nuclear missiles. And we arrive on a fateful day um, that you'll probably have never heard of, but that you might remember after you've heard what might have almost happened then. And that is October 27th, 1962. So the day after the UN Security Council, oh sorry, two days after the UN Security Council meets. On 6 a.m., the CIA reports to Kennedy that there are Soviet missiles on Cuba and that they believed they were ready to be fired. Whether or not that was true, 
has never been conclusively uh, established, at least to my knowledge. But the CIA tells Kennedy they can fire these rockets now. At 10 a.m., the Soviet leader Khrushchev receives a letter from Castro in which Castro seems to imply, hey guys, we're really with our backs to the wall. If you want to launch a nuclear attack on the U.S. from Cuba, you guys go ahead and we will basically die as martyrs to the communist cause. Which, of course, didn't necessarily relieve tensions. At 12 p.m., so only two hours after this, a U.S. spy plane that flies over Cuba is shot down by Cuban forces and the U.S. is escalating its own um, response. Um, because now they know, okay, now some serious things are going down. Two hours later, a routine reconnaissance flight of the U.S. all the way up there in Alaska accidentally flies into the Russian airspace. Uh, this is not a planned uh, detour. The Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union sends its own fighter planes to intercept this U.S. spy plane and to escort it back into uh, U.S. airspace. But in response to those Soviet fighters being scrambled, the U.S. scrambles its own fighters, with the slight um, difference there being that the U.S. fighter planes have nuclear air-to-air -air missiles on board. And then we finally arrive at 3 p.m., so 3 p.m., October 27th, 1962. There is a submarine somewhere in the Caribbean. That submarine is a Russian submarine. It has not had contact with Moscow in a couple of days, at least not close contact. It has also just been hit by, accidentally again, it has just been hit by some depth charges from an American destroyer. Now, the Americans up there didn't actually know that the Russian submarine was down there, but the Russians didn't know that. What the Russians thought was, okay, crap, they're bombing us, we think the war might have started. And they couldn't phone home and ask whether that's the case. The problem in this scenario was that the Russian submarine had nuclear torpedoes on board that were of a similar strength as the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. There were three people on board of that submarine, B-59, that had to basically turn a key to make that nuclear torpedo go and potentially start a war. The first guy was the commander of the submarine and he had given his assent. Yes, that, that should be launched. He believed that, yes, the war had been started. He was the captain of the ship. There was a political officer on board that also, in his estimation, said, yep, yeah, we think that the war has started. And then there was a third guy on board that had to turn the key. The third guy was this man that you see here, Vasily Arkhipov. And he was the one that refused in this situation to give his consent to launch the torpedo. And the torpedo launch was aborted. That moment there in which, you know, the world kind of held its breath without even really knowing it could have been very much the day that uh, the Third World War could have started and a nuclear war would have would have started for the very first time in world history. I can guarantee you if that guy that day hadn't refused to launch that torpedo, we would not be here. I would not be holding this lecture and the world would look very, very different. So remember this guy, there's a, there's a, a really interesting documentary on him that's called The Man Who Saved the World. So finally... After that had happened, everyone kind of stopped for a second and went, okay, hold on, this is all getting a little bit too tense. This is getting a little bit too prone to error. And Khrushchev basically uh, takes the first step back, publicly announces that the USSR would not, after all, station its missiles on Cuba. And then Kennedy opens secret back channels and promises that in return, the US would also withdraw its own missiles from Europe. What you see here is a couple of things. A, we came this close, this close, honestly, to nuclear war. We also see that escalation very much follows its own logic. And sometimes conflicts can erupt even when the actors themselves don't want it. So now we're not even talking about conflict that erupts because one nation wants war. You might have two players that both don't want war and they will still end up in war because there are always there's always the chance of miscalculations and errors and similar things as jfk put this very eloquently uh, after the crisis there's always some son of a bitch who doesn't get the word 
So in these, these situations, we're inherently extremely tense and prone to collapse. And it is, to be honest, a small miracle that in the entire time of the Cold War, this never really actually uh, turned into a hot war. Now, after the Cold War ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall and all these, all these good things, we had a fundamental disruption of how the world had been set up for the previous 45 years. We saw a wave of democratization go through uh, Eastern Europe, through Africa, through Asia. And we saw the U.S. emerge as kind of the only really serious global power. Um, uh, that situation was also called the unipolar moment. We're going to come back to that in the next lecture on realism. For Europe after the Cold War, if it had not already been the main project before, now it became really the main focus of the political will of the European states to create the European Union and to come closer together after the end of this Cold War. And then finally we have September 11th as maybe the most momentous event of the 21st century. You could certainly argue that many, many things that we're still struggling with today are really just the sort of the late uh, repercussions and echoes that we feel from that moment and everything that followed after that with the war on terror, with a global depression, um, and, and with the rise of ISIS, and so on and so forth. So that was a little ride through the uh, 20th century. Um, even if this sounded a little grim, because we were talking about wars a lot, even cold ones, Let's remember two things here uh, that maybe we can take away from the 20th century. The one is the world is becoming steadily more democratic. And this is a trend that is still unbroken. Now, whether or not all democracies function equally well isn't important at this particular point. But what we can see is that if we look at the history of the 20th century, we can see that after the Second World War, that the number of autocracies, that the red line on the left uh, graph here, has gone down. Um, time and time again, and that the uh, number of democracies in the world has increased. And we see that at the same time, the incidence of interstate warfare, so two states going to war, has diminished greatly, almost down to zero over time. That's the red line in the red graph. What we do see, though, that is that while the world overall might be a little more peaceful maybe than you know at least 30 years ago we also see that it's not necessarily the case that the world overall at the moment is seeing more peace than it used to but what we do see is that the conflicts that we have are no longer predominantly interstate conflicts where states uh, interact but they are intrastate conflicts what is here uh, sometimes uh, what is here called societal warfare so the world has become more democratic and in one dimension more peaceful even though overall we still see far too much conflict really and that's our takeaway point from the 20th century if you want to have the same thing that i've done in the past whatever hour or so of um uh, of world history but you want that in 18 minutes or even more in like six minutes watch this this youtube video which i think is hilarious uh, it's by bill Wirtz, uh called history of the entire world i guess and it will give you a wonderful ride through world history all the way from the creation of the universe with music so that was it for the history of the international system and i will see you in the next one for our first actual theory see you then